We are live. You're on that secondary camera. Over here? Yep. Hi, folks. Welcome. Tonight's topic is essential hand tools. We're alone, almost. There's just uh, Frick, Jake, Moose, and I. Luther's away. Super Dave on? Uh, I don't see him yet. Hopefully, he'll be there. He always pulls up the rear. Do you have a question to start off with, Frick? Uh, sure. Uh, let me Give see. me one. Got a lot of good stuff for you tonight, by the way. All right. First question comes from John Root in the chat. John? <laughs> yep. He says, is a router plane considered an essential tool? Why or why not? Yeah. Yeah, it is. I'll show you why. There's the two versions. The, the uh, small router plane, which I think was called the 271. Yep. And the, and the normal, well, regular one, which is the number 71. And the reason why they're important... Hey, Mickey. We got a little something going on in the background. So... I'm going to answer. I'm going to pause on that question for just a second. Bring me back to it, Frick. Yep. We uh, we are dealing with some models tonight, and this has to be very timely. Their attention span's a little short, so I'm going to get Moose to tell you a little bit. So we do we give giveaways every time we do this. Am I on the camera? Not yet. No, no. I'm on, I'm on the stationary one. Yeah. So we do giveaways, to show our appreciation. And inspire you to uh, help us with the Purple Heart Project by donating. And Moose has always been providing us with dead cat sweaters and golf sweaters. But he called me this week and he said, Rob, I got something that's the cutest little thing. So I thought what we would do is our theme, being September and back to school, we're going to tap into the grandfatherly part of you. And tonight we're going to give away three. I'm going to have him tell you what they are. You have your choice in case you don't have grandchildren. But I'm going to get Moose to tell you what these are. And then I'm going to have uh, my grandsons come out and show you them. You're on Jake's camera now. Actually, you can focus on them, and Moose can just talk and tell them what they are. Yeah. So these are these are what they call Peruvian happy sweaters, and uh, they're handmade in Peru. They're 40% uh, cotton, 30% acrylic, and 30% alpaca wool. And they have all these fun little. Nice little designs, and uh, we're going to put them on for 35 US. So we're going to give away three. <laughs> and if you, didn't, if you don't get lucky, you can go to Pat's Secret Garden and pick one up for yourself. What size is uh, like, we, we just have them in two, four, and six, and we, we have limited selection right now. All right, so what's... We have a... We have a I'll show you another. Nobody would send me shopping for kids' clothes. So this is Mickey. Hold on, Mick. Don't take it off yet. So this is Mickey. He is Mickey. Three. almost three. What size is this? Should say right on it. Right on the tag. Get your Grammy glasses on there. Yeah, <laughs> it's size four. So this is a size four. Mickey, turn turn around six. a little bit. Let them see what it looks like. Look at Jake. And you got a hood? You got a hood for when it's windy out? You put your hood up? Keep you really warm? Holy Is it toasty? Yes. Yes. And then, um, Cooper, how old are you, mister? Five. You're five? Are you sure? I don't think so. And he's got a six. So, so he's a size six. Turn around, let them see it. Uh, spin fast. Put your hood up. If it's a cold day, you put your hood up. There we go. Is that warm? Is that cozy? Yeah, very right, boys. The models. And then there's pink ones. Well, we also have some ladies' colors. We didn't have ladies' models. So. No. Frick has yet to been able to produce little girls. Yeah. I'm too manly. It's on Frick. <laughs> Beautiful. So that's, uh, that's some of our, I'm going to tell you about the rest of our gifts a little bit later. Tell them about the bench. Oh, and this is, uh, so Mickey discovered this. I built this bench. They want to know the dimensions. Of the bench? Of the kids' workbench, yeah. Okay, hold on. So I built this bench. Kim, who did this for? Rex? 
So he would have been what? A little smaller than he is now. Yeah. <laughs> so when Rex was just a little boy, I made this bench for him on Christmas. And it went through Rex and Jake. And then we had a string of girls. Jake was a little baby. Jake was a little baby? Yeah. When he played on this? Yeah. yeah. So it's got, a, it's got a shoulder vise. You want to show them how you put the wood in so that you can cut dovetails? Come around this side. Come around this side and show them how you put the wood in and how you make it. So you put your board down in there. Remember I told you to put it in the middle? Yeah. Keep your fingers out of the way. Put it in the middle of this. Put your board in. Put your board in there. Now tighten it up. Tight. No. <laughs> no. That's it. That's it. You need the brotherly's help. There you go. Okay, now it holds the board good and firm. We ne <laughs> and then we let it out. We never did get the tail vise finished. My children lived in, my our oldest daughter slept in a, literally in a drawer for the first, how long? Six months. So it is 40 and a half inches long. At its widest point, it is 18 and a half. The core is nine and an eight. Now the height, and, and if, if I was doing it over again, I would have made it with adjustable legs because uh, Rex grew fast and it was banging him on the knees by the time he was three. 18 and a quarter inches tall. All right, dovetails on it. Is there dovetails on the corner? It was, a, it was an exact mini of my, of my first bench, so nicely dovetailed corners. I didn't do through wedge tenons on the base, but I did it. I started at Christmas Eve, and I had it ready. I worked all night, in fact, I remember. And it was ready under the tree when they got up in the morning. And I'm surprised it's... so excited. Uh, yeah. I'm surprised it survived all these years, but nobody's used it in the last little while. We just dug it out, and Mickey's been in there playing with it. Well, Super Dave used to use it. Well, yeah, Super Dave cut his teeth on it. It's a little tall for him. So back to the, back to the router planes. Uh, if I had to choose one, I probably would choose this one first and this one second. And the question was why? Well, they do a job. You can use them for several things. If you want to, if you cut a rabbit or... Better yet, let me actually let me give you a couple examples. I've got a drawer sitting here. Kirk, take that out with them. I like your sweaters, you boys. Like they look really good. <laughs> Cutest little things I've seen in a long time. Kirk, you're, there's a door there. You're cutting a groove to house the bottom of your drawer. And if you don't have one of our drawer bottom planes and you've done it either with a router or a table saw, in order to make sure that that groove is the same depth all the way, you can use a router plane, set it for whatever depth you want, it rests on the surface, and it'll give you that level of precision you're looking for. You can get several different size cutters for it. There's a little kit. There's a, there's a quarter inch cutter. There's this pointed one. And then there's an eighth inch pointed one. Actually, I think it's 3.30 seconds. And then there's a small straight bit. And you can buy, okay, so that covers the small router. And then the large router, I, I've added this base, but what you can do on the large router is you can get this adapter and that will allow you to go in and use any of those other cutters. So it gives you quite, it's quite versatile. But would I put this on my list? I think I used to, I used to, I think I used to, when I used to give everybody a top 10 tool list, I think that used to come in like at number 11. So right up there. I would definitely want it in my arsenal because it's, it's extremely precise. So I want to give you some more examples. You're cutting a mortise and tenon and the tenon isn't quite perfect. You want the cheeks of the tenon to be parallel to the side of the piece. So what you will do with a router plane your tenon is projecting over here, you'd come in with your router plane, set the, set the blade referencing off of the left side, you'd go forward and back, and what that would do is make sure that that, that uh, surface that has been cut is now parallel 
to the top side or the main face of the board and it does an extremely good job of doing something like that so I would put it way up there in the priority list good luck getting one though that's the problem don't like the original Stanley's I don't like the way they held on to the cutter the that Lee Nielsen made a huge improvement when they did theirs good question next one Frick okay next one comes from Mark Hunter in England hi Mark he says, I have a small workshop and have not made a workbench. What would be the best type of workbench you suggest to build as an essential first bench? Well, sorry for the self-promotion, but the whole idea behind the Cosman workbench was to build a bench that, uh, build a bench that could be done in maybe a weekend. If you, if you had two days to work on it, you could easily get it finished. It's built out of uh, one sheet of MDF, one inch preferably, and one sheet of five eighths or three quarter inch plywood. I prefer to use Baltic birch. And that's, a, that's pretty much it. There's a few odds and ends that you're gonna need. But can we, can we how far can we go, Frick? Mm. Uh, Not very far. Well, I'll bring it over here. You sing and dance for a second. I'll bring one over, it's on hey, wheels. Hey, come here, come here. Let me unload it. Watch out, Mike. Coming through, brother. Hey, Rex. No. Nope. That's not going to go over that, is it? No. Nope. always this clumsy so here's your bench now let me tell you why this is the bench that I would recommend you can do whatever size you want and the biggest mistake a lot of people make is they make their bench too wide you can't you can't plane out there so if you're thinking hand tools keep it narrow you look at the core of my bench the actual working surface I think it's 17 inches 17 and 8 inches I stretched it on this one I went to 20 Go beyond that and it's just impossible to really work. Never wanted anything to be wider. So I did mine 60 by 20. If you're using one sheet, I think, what do we figure you could go 64? I think you could make it 64. So starting off with a sheet of one inch MDF, which is preferred. Why MDF? Well, because it's flat, it's stable, it doesn't move, and it's inexpensive. So if you take that sheet, now they always give you an extra inch in both directions. So a four by eight sheet is going to end up being 97 inches long by 49 inches wide. And you rip two 20 inch strips. We have a video that walks you all the way through this. But you take on those four, uh, 96 in, 97 inch strips, you cut off a 60 inch piece. So you have two premium 60 inch pieces and you've got two pieces left over. So. The full size piece on top, a full size piece on bottom, and the two pieces that make up the middle section are joined in the middle. Glue the whole thing together, and it's as if it's all now one piece. So you've got three inches of MDF. It's heavy, it's solid, and it stays nice and flat. The base is made up of four pieces of uh, 5 8 inch Baltic birch. And the nice thing about Baltic birch is it's, it's not, they don't use a cheap, inexpensive core. So it's, it's birch wood cut very thin into what we would call veneer. And just like the way plywood is made, but each piece is the same thickness. Well, when you glue them all together and the way we do it, you build it almost like Lego. It's being glued and stapled together while you're building it. So when you're done, you don't have to have a hundred clamps. It's all done. And when it's set up, it's like you're dealing with a two and a quarter inch thick of thick piece of plywood. 
and it's just really easy to do. You watch the video, and it's a piece of cake. Anybody can do it, and, and thousands of people have done it. And you end up with something that will last you for a lifetime, as long as you don't get it wet. Um, what I add to it is I put a sharpening station over here, just nothing more than a piece of exterior grade plywood on a piece of hardwood with a, about a one degree slope, attach it here, and this is where all my sharpening gear sits. I put a tray underneath just because it's nice to have a place to put some stuff, but I prefer to keep this open so that I can clamp to this. So if I'm building a chest of drawers, I can lay them on the side and then literally clamp from the top of the chest to underneath here, and that works as a big call. Um, bench lamp is a nice feature, and it just means another, I, use, I prefer to use the one inch bench dogs. These are the ones we sell because they're aluminum. If you hit your plane with them, you don't destroy your plane. The one inch, you get a little more, a little wider work surface to go up against. The narrower that is, the more it's gonna stick into your wood. These things are angled on the face so you don't have to bore angled holes. Your holes can be perpendicular. And you always want an angle on the face because if you don't, when you tighten it up, when you tighten the board between two bench dogs, if they're not, if the faces aren't angled or the dogs aren't angled, it'll pop up and won't stay put. So that's why that's built in there. So we, we, make, we, we sell a, a bench lamp with a little mushroom on it, and that fits in any one of those dog holes, so it makes it really easy to illuminate what you're working on. And the best part of this is the vise, because uh, when we went to work on this, what, what's the matter? Hey, that's a good sweater. Good thing you're taking it home. Moose has to have it. You're dumb with it? Yeah, I'm cold. I need to put it on. <laughs> the best part of this, and the part that really brought all this together, is when we found this um, Schoberg bench vise, which is easily the best woodworking vise you're going to find. And I'll, I'll just give you a couple of the features because this is what this is what makes it what it is. You open up any vise that you buy like this, and by the way, this this fastens on with eight lag bolts. That's all there is to it, isn't it? Just eight mm -hmm. lag bolts. It's probably no more than a 15 to 20 minute procedure to attach it. If you're able to look underneath, it's just a flat piece that attaches on there. It comes all attached. You've got to put the vise on the jaw, and even that is easy. But the best part of it is, instead of round tubes, it uses rectangular tubes. And if I can open this up enough and you can look in, you'll see why it works so well. The thing that you don't want in your vise is you don't want it to rack. In case you don't understand what that means, racking means that as you tighten it up, this twists, and in the process of twisting, it leaves part of your board flopping, and it only tightens on the inside. Well, if you look down here real carefully, on either side of these rectangular tubes, now this is all welded together and it's pretty rigid. There's a phenolic strip right here, which is kind of a naturally oily plastic type material that this slides along. There's one over here as well, but then there's a steel bar in here that goes the full length. And there's two set screws, one at the front and one at the back. So all you do is you adjust those set screws until you have just enough tension on this that it won't allow it to move side to side and it'll keep it nice and stiff. So you can clamp a board that's, well, I've got this set up so I can put a piece in there that's five and a half inches wide, and it'll support it over its whole width so when you're sawing, it's not wiggling on one end or the other. Works fantastic. So, best bench, this is the best bench. If you go out and try hey, to- Hey, 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 What? That? What was that doing up here? Right there with that one. Yeah. Didn't land on the tip. No. Did you explain oh, yeah. why you it use is. MDF yeah. instead of Baltic birch for the top? Um, it's a question from Charlie McBride. Yeah. Uh, even bir Baltic birch plywood, if you take a piece of Baltic birch plywood and measure it, it's going to be a different thickness all the way along. The, uh, the MDF is going to be your best bet for uniform thickness throughout. It's relatively inexpensive. And it's heavy and dense, so uh, that's why we started using it. It's an inexpensive product, and what can I tell you? We're experimenting with using Baltic birch, but we're having to have a big press made because you, yeah, this, the problem is trying to glue three pieces together when they're not all the same thickness. 
So you get pressure on one side, but then another area won't have enough pressure. So we're going to work through that. But for right now, you can, and you can use three quarter bolt. You can use three quarter MDF if you can't find the one inch, but the one inch is a little bit nicer to work with. Anyway, um, if you plan on doing something like this anytime soon for the rest of the month, Probably the, the, the sale on the, uh, on the vices, sale. is that off? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, we got vices. If you need them, if you can't find them somewhere, we just brought in a whole bunch of them. Uh, we, you can, and I, when I first designed this, I had two vices. I had a face vice over here, and I had the tail vice down here. So this is the one where you're doing your dovetailing. This is the one that you use with the bench dog up to hold a piece of wood flat on your bench while you're planing it. And then I realized, well, shoot, you could do dovetails down here as well, which eliminated the cost of one vice. But the original plans does, uh, called for a vice on there, and you could put it on the other side if you're left-handed. So, And the tool tray on the outside, we just added that. That was easy. It's a, a big, uh, big U-shaped affair dovetailed on each corner and a piece of um, half-inch plywood that you use as a bottom, but you let the plywood run in there a couple of inches and then just screw up through the bottom and it holds it on. I, I like to have a tool tray just because I'd rather have the stuff end up falling in the tray instead of onto the floor. Good question. And then uh, a workbench is almost the first thing. In fact, a little heads, a little um, shout out. So we now have what's called the Bench Brigade. And this is headed up by, uh, by Jack Lane down in Texas. And uh, Chris Chahusky helps him in terms of getting all of this all over the country. But these are uh, organized civilians who, at their own expense, procure all of these materials, build the bench to our specs, we provide them with the vise, and then Jack organizes it so that the individual that built the bench can actually deliver it to the combat wounded vet who has been to our workshop so that he gets to have events, a bench to take home. And the, the guys in our class three, four weeks ago each got to take home a bench. So it was, that was the first time we did a class where the guys in the class, at the end of the class, got to take the bench home with them, which is fantastic. So big shout out to the bench brigade, Jack, Chris, and all the others. There's 150 members or more. And we got a big, we, we got a Canadian chapter up in uh, Moncton. Uh, Jim and his crew are actually, we got to get in touch with them because of some problems we ran into for this next class. But They've committed to build, building 10 benches a year for us. It's all good. These guys are great. It's the way they step up. Next, Frick. Um, just a couple quick questions on the bench. Uh, is there a small portable bench, or is that the one you recommend? Well, the, when you get into uh, when you get into handwork and you're going to be planing. You're, 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 uh, by the way, these are, um, let me just back up a little bit. So these bench casters are made by Woodcraft. The problem is they're too light. So you put them on there. If you're moving your bench around, you hit a little bump on the floor, it'll bend the, it'll bend the, the and they don't work anymore. So we have a, a Superman named Willie. He's 80 years old, retired fabricator. Runs around here like he's 79. And he, what's he, he takes them, he adds a, a steel plate on here, welds it on, cleans them all up, and makes it so that they'll hold probably double what they're stated to hold. But they work really nicely because you just have to clip them up with your, pick them up with your foot, like so, and that drops the bench down. Now your bench doesn't move on you. And to transport it, you just have to pull that out from the, Pull that out from the side, step down on it, and it pops them back up and makes it real easy to move around. So if you're, in a, if you're in a garage and you have to share it with your wife's car, you need something like this. My point in, in talking about that was, if you're planing, you want to have a bench that's going to stay put. You don't want to be chasing it all over the garage. So you get down to a certain size, you're going to run into that issue. If I was going to say, okay, how could I cut this down? Well, I could easily drop it. I could do the same thing I did over here. I could drop it down three inches, and I, it wouldn't bother me at all. Uh, Lengthwise, it's 60 now. Actually, this is one of the older ones. This is 62. I could, you know, I could break that down to four feet and probably be okay. You think? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm like helium. I fill all available space, so you don't believe what it takes to clean my bench off. But I wouldn't, I don't think I'd want to go any smaller than four feet. 
Yeah. Customize it to whatever you want. But, I mean, it's a real pain if you're having to have three other tables set up somewhere to store all of your stuff. It's really nice to be able to have a shooting board on your bench so that, because it's an integral part of what you do. I'm constantly using that. And uh, it's nice if your bench is big enough that you can actually have that tucked away in one corner and still be able to do your work on the other side. Next, Frick. I, I love talking about benches. I could go on forever about that. I just, it's such the central focus of your shop. And I keep reminding people, this becomes your reference plate. This is what everything in your, that you build is going to be referenced off of. So it needs to be flat. It needs to be stable. The, the better your workpiece is held, the better will be the result. I have worked in some of the on the most, some of the most miserable benches trying to demonstrate and worse, watching people trying to learn on a vice that just will not hold the work, which is why I'm so insistent. If you take it like I'm overselling it, well, too bad. But you have to, you have to, uh, you have to pay attention to what I'm saying and not make the mistake and say, oh, I'm not going to spend that kind of money. Well, then fine. Be prepared for an awful lot of frustration. Are you ready? Now, see that? Nice and solid. It's not moving out there. It's not moving over there. So you can tell as soon as you hear it starting to saw. Sawing on the inside. Good and solid. No change in the sound. That's what you want. That's what will allow you to do good work. Next, Frick. Okay, next question uh, comes from Rex you B. Said you said you, you had a couple of... You said you had a couple of that. You had a couple of bench questions. Well, I th uh, I think I lost the other one. Well, uh, actually, they said, "How do you stain MDF?" You're not you're not centered in the shot. Move to the right, left. How do how do you stain MDF? Yeah, I don't stain it. What what did you put on the top? I think. Um, well, we I used to oil them. I used to use a tongue oil. The problem is that. Um, the edges of MDF are extremely hungry, so you could oil that 15 times and it's still going to suck that oil in at a disproportionate rate than it does on the top or the bottom. So I found it's a lot easier to spray them with lacquer. So, I mean, we have the facility to do that. So I would spray the edges maybe three times and then come in and spray the top and the bottom and the edge, top, bottom, and edge, and maybe a third time, top, bottom, and edge, and then be done with it. But uh, the edges are going to suck the material up quite a bit more. But anyway, I just like the lacquer because it's so much easier. If you're going to oil it, it's the process is going to take you 10 days because you've got a day between. And I can do, th I can do all of those coats of lacquer in an afternoon. Next, Rick. All right, next question comes from Rex B. in Florida. Hi, Rex. He says, as a beginning woodworker, what chisel should I buy first, brand and size, please? Okay. Well, we actually just had some new chisels come out. We just released them yesterday, but you're going to talk, I, and I assume you're talking furniture. So, um, I always try to preface my, er, uh, not preface, yes, preface what I say with not necessarily an apology, but I, I'm, I never tell people to go buy junk. Even if you, if you can't afford it, wait until you can. Save your penny, pennies. Everybody has a certain amount of disposable income, and you use it on something, whether it's fast food or booze. Put both of them away, and you'd be better off anyway. Buy good tools. You'll love them for life. I would suggest at a bare minimum that you start with a quarter and a half for sizes. And that's going to cover the bases quite well. If I was going to add one to it, I would add in a three-quarter. Do you need a 5 16 Probably not. Do you need a 5 8 Probably not. These you can pretty much make do everything you need to. Now there is one exception to that, and that is the 8th inch. And I say that only because you can always use a narrower chisel in a wider opening, but you can't use a wider chisel in a narrower opening. So at some point you may need to invest in the 8th inch. The brand. Well, I'm going to give you two options here. I don't have one, Jake. Yes, I do. No, I don't. Um, in back? Huh? Well, that's the one that we, you cut in, down. No, in back. Oh, oh, yes, right. No. Yes, yes, you do right there. 
Oh, yeah. Need new glasses. So here are the two brands, and I'm going to lean heavily on the IBC. Why? Well, for lots of reasons. Uh, when you buy a chisel, they're not ready to be used. You have work to do. It's like buying a rifle and expecting it to come from the sporting goods store already um, dialed in. You're going to want to do that yourself. So when you prepare the backs, you want them to sit nice and flat. All the other chisels have some kind of a ferrule or cone on here that may that'll end up touching the stone, and that screws up the process if you're not careful. When you on the IBC, you can take the chisel handles off, and that lays perfectly flat on the stone. Nothing gets in your way, so real wow. easy to do. The other nice thing about it is, if you want to have your own handles, or if you want to make handles that are lighter, or heavier, or prettier, or whatever you want. You simply take a piece of wood, drill, what size is that, do you remember? It's a little bigger than 3 8 It's about a 3 8 A 3 8 inch diameter hole, turn your handle, this goes down, this connector goes down through, you put your ferrule on, screw that in place, and because you're sandwiching the piece of wood between the steel ferrule on one end, and the aluminum cap on the other end, you're never actually hitting the wood. So you can use any wood, any species you want. You could use a piece of burl or a piece of pine if you want a really light chisel. You're hitting this. So that's a nice feature. You have the appropriate relief angles on the side. This is called a beveled edge chisel so that when you're cutting dovetails, you can get in between the tails and not bruise them. It has good steel. You want that. But I tell people, I said, you know what? The ergonomics are more important than the steel. If it's not comfortable to use, you won't want to use it. If it is comfortable, that's number one. A close second is good steel. This is cryogenically treated, triple or double tempered? I think it's double. Double tempered uh, A2 steel. What's all that mean? You sharpen it. It's no harder to sharpen than any other steel. Don't believe that. But it'll hold an edge sufficiently long. You're not going to get an edge that will never break down. That's not the way it works. It has to be soft enough that you can sharpen it, hard enough that it'll hold an edge. So my recommendation is the IBC. Are they expensive? Yes, but you only have to buy three of them. And if you don't want to do that, for half the price, you can buy the Wood River. And this is what I would call a decent... Pardon? Less than half. Less than half? But close, isn't it? Yeah. This is what I would call a decent chisel. It's a, it's a socket, so I'm not a big fan of it because... The socket, the handles fall off, and they fall off at the most inopportune time. That never happens with the IBC. So, and if you're going to go just one chisel, start with a quarter. Quarter, half, three quarter, eight. And at that point, you can fill in whatever you want. If you're interested, well, since we're talking about chisels, I will tell you this. So, we started working with IBC on mortise chisels. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to say it was 10 years ago or more. And we finally got them to sell two days ago, Jake. Mm -hmm. There's six sizes. There's only five right now, but there will be six sizes available. Three sixteenths, quarter, five sixteenths, three eighths, and half. Seven sixteenths. Seven sixteenths, sorry. Now, you just, Rob, you just finished saying you only need two chisels, or three at the most. That's true on beveled edge. But on mortise chisels, the size of your tenon is dictated by the size of your mortise chisel. So if you're dealing with three-quarter stock, you're going to want a quarter-inch mortise. If you're dealing an inch-and-a-half stock, you're going to want a half-inch mortise. If you're dealing with something in between, you're going to want either a 7 16 or a 3 8 mortise. Different applications are going to require a different chisel. So this is not used in the same way that these are. Um, I'm going to just, while I'm talking to you about this, the small sizes, the 3 sixteenths, the quarter, and the 5 sixteenths are three-eighths of an inch thick this way. And I always prefer them to be square, parallel sides. Why? Because when you're chopping, that square side will help prevent the chisel from twisting on you as you're pounding down into the hole. If you tried to do that with a beveled edge, you don't have any reference on the side and that thing's going to be twisting all the time. 
you also want it to be stout because you're chopping and prying, chopping and prying. That's not designed for prying. This is. You see the difference. A lot of beef. On the 3 8 7 16 and half, the chisels are half an inch thick in this direction. They're, they're I, I was thoroughly impressed. Thrilled how they look. Uh, so many times when you buy a mortise chisel, they're a big pick sticker that's about two feet we long. Some right there. Huh? Yeah, and, and it's unnecessary. When are you ever, you're building furniture, when are you ever going to chop a mortise deeper than that? Typically, you're going to be somewhere around here. This just fits lovely in the hand. I will, I will caution you, make sure that before you use them that you really tighten up those handles so that when you're prying on that, there's no give up in there. Same type of handle, by the way. This is a just this is a Macassar ebony one that. Uh, uh, that's not Macassar ebony, is it? Mm -hmm. That a med turned for me. But you can change the handles out same way. Great chisels, and I think we may still have. Well, there's a few left on there. I know uh, they went pretty quick. And they're expensive, but so what? They're good. The better they are, the more expensive they're going to be. You only have to buy them once. Don't worry about it. Save your money, get the good stuff, cry once. It's always been my motto. Next, Rick. Uh, good topics, by the way, coming up. I, I love talking hand tools. And, I and get you off on the right foot so that you don't end up getting frustrated because the problem with too bad tools, they take you down a path that is, leads to nothing but frustration and you'll eventually quit it because it's not, it's not worth the hassle. Next, Rick. All right, next one comes from uh, Bert Rodriguez. Hi, Bert. Where hey. is he? Uh, he's in the chat. He didn't I didn't say. I keep where looking he's over at this big green globe. Did you, see, did you show them what we, we, well, we look at? Seen it. That's frick behind there. It allows the shop to be. Yes, it's a, yeah. called a green screen. Uh, he says, "Why does a moon? Why doesn't Rob use hand planes like Stanley Forty Five or Fifty Five for grooves, beads, roundovers, etc.? They work great, in my opinion. I use them all the time. Um, I have. A f what, 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 where is it anyway? No idea." I've got a 45 somewhere. Um, probably have never had the time to play around with it. I'll dig it out. I'll dig it out and, and, and see if we can't do a little, an episode on it at some point. But no particular reason. Just, just uh, never really had a reason for it, I suppose. I, I can't really give you anything other than what I just said. So I will. I'll make it a point. I want to talk to you about my new saw, too, at some point. So if somebody's got some saw questions, bring them out, and I'll put me in the mood. Next, Rick. Uh, next one comes from Cass Enlin in East Jordan, Michigan. Hi, Cass. He says, do you have a preferred weight mallet for specific joinery that you're doing? Uh, a preferred weight? Yeah. I, we actually make two of them, and that's only because I use two of them. So... This one is, what's the weight on this? The big one or the small one? The big one, the regular one. Around 400 grams. 400 grams on the small one? 250. 250. So most of the time I'm using the large mallet. And it's just got the right weight. So Sean Mahaffey, a friend of ours, that provides us with the mallet heads. He sends us blocks of maple that have been dried and resin impregnated. In case you don't know what that means. Am I talking over here? I, I'm looking at you. Uh, they take this piece of maple and they put it in a vacuum chamber after they've dried and removed all the moisture. And as they pull out the air, the resin has to go in and replace the air. And then it solidifies. So it increases the weight by probably 30 or 40 percent and makes it considerably harder than it would be otherwise. And you can see that uh, as much as I wail on that, it doesn't show much more than a few dents. And it turns nicely too. So that's my preferred mallet. If I'm doing something that's dainty, cutting dovetails on little tiny drawers, I, uh, some people will just push the chisel through. I prefer to tap. I, just, I like the fact that with a mallet, you can apply increase or decrease the amount of effort so readily. That's my preference. We always tape the handles. Why? Because it enables you to be able to get a decent grip on it. And if you're uh, over 60, you've probably got a bit of arthritis, so you know what I'm talking about. And it's nice to not have to deal with that. So, and my son Rex 
and Harold Snodgrass, who works here, are the ones that make the mallets now. Tape them up. We send them to all of our tools that we send you, with the exception of chisels being sharpened. We send them to you all ready to go. I keep forgetting to look over here. Next one, Frick. All right. Uh, Luke Deedman in England. Hey, Luke. He says, hi, Rob. Appreciate all the videos you have on YouTube. Gained a lot of knowledge over the last year. What You're welcome. Would, what would you recommend? Uh, okay, actually, that's more about chisels. Never mind. We already went through that. Um, Brian Fugati in Mino, North Dakota. Hi, Brian. Could I know a, that name. Could a Stanley 78 hand plane take the place of the Lee Nielsen skewed rabbit block plane for Cosmo style dovetails? Um, Stanley 78. I think that's the one. It's a, it's, if I, I can't remember if the 78 actually has the blade on a skew angle or not. But let me, let me just address, let me address the two methods of doing that. And who, wh what's his name? Brian? Brian, yep. So uh, Brian is making reference to a little rabbit or a rebate that we cut on the edge of the board. I often wonder if... Uh, if the people that are watching, how many of them have never seen any of this done? I hate repeating myself for fear of boring them. But when you're cutting a dovetail, it's nice to have a little rabbit cut on the underside. What was it I was going to talk? Oh, yeah. I'll, remind me to introduce the program, the PHP fairly soon. So let me just uh, throw this together real quick. So this is my pin board. I would measure it, setting my marking gauge on like so, and then I would go in and I would go all the way around what we call the tail board. And at some point I'm going to have to take my tail board and put it over top of the pin board to transfer tails to pins. Well, you don't want to have it sticking out beyond. You don't want to have it in there. You need to have it perfectly lined up. So if you have what's called a skew block plane, actually what I should do is cut the end off of this so I can do both, show them both examples, right? Mm. I'm going to do the same thing on the other end. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because Lee Nelson, I don't think even has the skew block plane on their website anymore. I know they haven't discontinued it, but they've postponed it because they haven't been able to get caught up. So what I do, if I had a skew block plane, I'd put my board in the vise, end of the board hanging out over the edge, I take my skew block plane, it has a removable fence. In case you've never seen it, I'll show you what it looks like. Is this mine or Super Dave's? Uh, yours. So that, that is a, that's held on there with these two screws and these pins, and it's a regular block plane of sorts. When you take this off, it exposes the blade. And by exposing the blade, you're now able to make a cut that brings you right over to the edge. So what I would do is set this plane up so that the blade is sticking just beyond the edge. I sight down the sole to make sure that it's parallel to the sole. Lock it. This one has, and this is the advantage of the skew block plane over the 78, is that this one has a fence on it that you can adjust. So I would adjust that fence so that the point of the blade is right on that gauge line. Lock the fence. And then you can come in here and make one, two, three passes. And can you pick that? Can you pick that up on that? Mm -hmm. That gives you a little rabbit. Now when I, after I've cut the tails, I set this piece over top of this one. And that little rebate or rabbit lines up these two pieces perfectly. Now, if you don't have that, we just started, we, we used so much of this, we said we should provide this. So this is automotive refinishers masking tape. Refinish. Refinish masking tape. It's a little bit thicker by a thousandth of an inch than regular tape, painter's tape. Um, the other big advantage is that it's stickier. 
So what I would do is I'd come in here and I would put multiple layers. I say multiple, probably five. One on top of the other. Make sure it's really stuck well to the bottom piece. I'll do one more. I think that's actually four. Then I would take a sharp knife and I would come in here and trim that back so it doesn't interfere. Now I take my marking gauge and I would just go over that gauge line a few times. Then I can come in here, peel this piece off, and that serves as that same rabbiting fa rabbit fence that I had with the skew block plane. And it actually does a pretty good job. I was quite surprised. I thought it was going to move, but it, it doesn't. There's enough surface area and enough contact. And then the other advantage, of course, is you haven't had to cut into this if that's an issue, making drawers it would be. When you're done, you just peel that off, and away you go. So that stuff is now on our website, and it's great tape. Uh, if you've ever wondered what's in Rob's top drawer, the one he gets access the most, five or six different types of tape because I find all kinds of uses for it. It's kind of like a, a um, temporary clamp. Works extremely well. Now, did that finish off the skew block plane? Yeah, he was asking why you don't use... Or if the Stanley 78 would oh, be a good choice. Oh, yeah. Sensor. All right. So the reason why this, the Stanley 78, it doesn't have a fence. So you've got to go in there and set up a fence. You probably could make it work. Um, yeah. You, there's a level of accuracy that you have to maintain when you do this. And I always would tell my students when we first start, I almost don't even teach it this way anymore because so few people have access to the skew block plane since they haven't been available for probably the last two years. After you've made that cut, you need to put a straight edge on like this, hold it up to the light, and verify that that gap is uniform, meaning this surface, while lower than this one, must be parallel to it. If it's sloped one way or the other, it's going to throw you off, so you've got to be careful. It takes a little bit to get, to use, get used to using this. It's somewhat heavy. You're starting your cut by just referencing on this little pad out here, so it's wanting to fall back. So. I keep my thumb on the top knob, I keep my, my finger pressed against the fence, and I rotate like that. And by the way, when you buy this, you only cut the metal parts. This is an added on piece. And we've had enough people ask, we actually now supply these, we, we offer these, uh, these uh, accurately made little um, wooden fences. Okay, next Rick. Okay, next one comes from uh, Will Downing, and hey, Will. he says, on the topic of saws, what brand of panel saw do you recommend since Lee Nielsen isn't making any? Also, do you plan to make any panel saws? <laughs> yes. Um, wow. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't understand why companies don't respond to demand. If I had uh, my door being beat down with people wanting uh, a tool... I, what more motivation would you need to go out and make it? But that has been the case with Lee Nelson ever since I've known them, which goes back to 2000. They've never, certain items, they just have never been able to make enough. So whose would I buy? I ordered one, I won't bother saying the name. I ordered another one from, I would ordered a set from another guy 10 years ago. Never heard tell of it. Never, never delivered. So I don't know. Aside, uh, uh, short of buying an old distant, an old uh, antique, and then redoing it yourself. But the average guy doesn't know enough about it to go in there and restore it. It's kind of like chicken and the egg. you got to get some experience with the saw before you know enough to go in and adjust the set and joint the saw and refile the teeth if they need to be reshaped and going through all of that process. So we are looking as seriously at making our own saws and offering them for sale. Speaking of which, so I've been talking about this for a while. What? Oh, Jake's going to come in? Yeah, it'd be better for that. This is my uh, little commercial that you allow me to sneak in every, uh, every episode. This every is, ex this is exclusive, right? This is the first? Yeah, yeah. This is, this is, the, uh, this is the big grand opening. Shoot, Jake. 
I can't reach up there. Been asking for a long time for this one. Yeah, what, what do we have? Do I have an example here of um, small, the small dovetails I'm talking about? I suppose some of these. These, the, well, these little ones on the bottom, I'll take this one right here. So, when it comes to cutting small dovetails, even smaller than this, actually, yeah. I was I was making a... Uh, right there. What? Right there on that, uh, on, set, on that chest of drawers. Well, I, I'm going to go over here. I got, I got it right here. I got the perfect one right here. Mm. So... My dovetail saw is designed to cut drawer dovetails. What are drawer dovetails? Well, I just showed you one. These ones, carcass dovetails. When it comes time to cutting small dovetails like that, or even smaller little dovetails like that, my dovetail saw just felt too big. It almost knocked the piece over. So I had been wanting. Now, I have a good friend. i gotta go, I got to go find it. Can you uh, sing or talk or something for just a second while I go Isn't find... Isn't that it right there? Huh? I don't think so. No, it's not. No. This is a saw that belonged to uh, Leonard Robichaud. Can you still hear me? Right now I can. Leonard Robichaud was the father of my friend John Robichaud. John's been a good friend of mine for a long time. And Leonard was a uh, World War II vet that fought all the way through. <laughs> Injured numerous times, but made it all the way through the war. And this saw belonged to him. And John brought it up to me one time to sharpen. And I just fell in love with it. I thought it was the cutest little thing. And that, it's not that I haven't returned it. It's just John never came back to pick it up yet. So I am naming. I have a soft spot in my heart for vets. World War II vets in particular. So this belonged to Leonard Robichaud. And he went by the name Len. Isn't that a cute little saw? So I decided to make a small dovetail saw. So this is going to be the Len Robichaud saw. So on the back side, it'll be engraved Len, Leonard, Len Robichaud. And this, what are we calling this? The three-quarter dovetail. It, uh, I'll, give you the, I'll give you the specs on it. We're actually going to start producing these this month. Uh, it has an inch and a quarter depth of cut. The blade is eight inches long. The back is three quarter by quarter by eight inches. Um, we, we haven't got the engraving done on this one yet, but it'll say it's 22 teeth per inch. So if you look closely on the tooth line, all the teeth are 22 TPI, that's teeth per inch. The first inch and a half, the teeth have a relaxed cutting face. So instead of being zero degrees, aggressive, they're relaxed about 25 degrees. Makes it easy to start. And then the rest of the teeth are zero degrees, very aggressive, fast cutting. Tooth out set per side. Cuts, I'll show you how it cuts. Uh, the handle was modified a little bit. So the handle is three quarter inches thick as opposed to... I'll just show that you see it up against. It makes my, my regular saw look like a monster. So my, this dovetail saw has a one inch thick handle. This one is three quarter, so it's considerably smaller, but, but it still comfortably fits uh, an adult male hand. I would consider my hand is somewhere, uh, um, oh, probably in the large size, because that's what size glove I wear. Now, if you want to know, I think I'm three and a half inches across the palm. Yeah, so from here to here is three and a half inches, and that'll pretty much tell you, give you some idea. Can you, put them, can you put them up next to each other? And if yeah. Jake can get an angle to show exactly. Yeah. No, well, the handle no, too. Uh, oh, the handle? We'll do so, both. So there's, there's the handle. I need the, I need the shot where I can see the thickness of both of them. Oh, you oh. want to see the thickness? Of okay. the handles, yes. There you go. Okay. All right, now show them. A little better seeing up at the top. Okay. Of course, I had to modify the handle in order to fit because of the smaller blade. But I, I worked on this last night. I finished it, I think, about 2.30 in the morning and uh, couldn't stop. Had to get it done. Just too excited about it. So what it'll, it's going to allow you to do is to come in here in this little thin work. I'm working on a piece of quarter-inch pine. There's not much to it. And you can just set that on there. 
and that'll just cut like butter. It still has the weight that you'll appreciate. Still a pistol grip, right? Yeah. Three finger open pistol grip. Cuts beautifully. Jake even thought it did. Can I explain what, I, what we're doing with the form yeah. there? Well, I, I'm curious to see how many people want it. Motivate me to get busy, but now this is a this is a, a obviously a second because there was a mark in the in the brass, but I just went through. And this will have a three pin, a three copper pin. In other words, put together the same way as all of the others, but light duty. So to give us a an idea on the initial production, I'm pasting right now a form. Uh, for those that are interested, it's not any commitment or anything, but just if you're considering uh, wanting one, which I see a few people are already. Um, if you can fill out the form and we'll get your email address and yeah, give uh, me some, give me some feedback. Let me know how many people want it. Do you have a, you have a price yet? Yeah, it'll be the same as the, the same as the other one. There's, there's no, uh, if anything, it takes a little bit longer just cause the pieces are a little smaller, but that'll, that'll improve as we get, we get the going. So it'll be the same as the other ones. Same as the regular dovetail 250. If you've been looking for something for that small work so we're calling it we're calling it the len robishoff three-quarter saw that's a mouthful but i had to i had to uh i had to show uh some uh, i can't know what the word would be but you know that was the reason why i did it and uh, i knew john's father leonard robishaw and he was a quiet man but just when you hear about what these guys did at age 18 and 19 it just it just uh it makes you shut your mouth and never complain about having a runny nose. That's what it does. And uh, someday I, told, I asked John to come on some night and tell the story of what his father went through during the war and what his mother did. And it's just it's a real heartwarming story. I'll have it. It'll, it'll be up. Maybe we'll even plan that for around November, uh, November from Remembrance Day. Okay. Next, Frick. All right, next one comes from John Root in Greenbrier, Arkansas. Hi, John. He says, shouldn't a light be essential? I know that I, for one, am needing more and more light to see things these days. I'm getting older and often results, which often results in weakening eyesight for many. You can't get enough. So everybody asked, so we did them. So we now provide these bench lamps. And what I like about it is it'll reach just about anywhere you want. What I don't like about it as it comes is it uh, the way they put them together you see this piece right here there's that that is such a weak link so you drill a half inch hole in your bench you put that in and in no time that breaks off and it digs up your bench so i haven't even done this one we put a piece of we put a steel rod up in there this one never got done right here oh yeah so what we do actually have a link that is huh it's not. This one isn't done either. <laughs> well, we will do it for yours. We put a steel rod up in there and then another nut and bolt to cinch it down. And that, that bypasses that weak link. And then we turn this little wooden mushroom so that that fits in there snugly enough that when it's in that, three, in that one inch diameter hole, instead of this turning in, this turning inside the half inch hole, the big block, the big mushroom turns in the one inch hole, lasts much longer. Works fantastic. And I agree, you can't have enough light on the situation. Really important. And the same thing, uh, same thing in the shop. We have, uh, what are these, Jake? LEDs, 65K. And we've got enough of them that there's no shadows anywhere. It just floods everything with light. So spend a little bit of money. And these are relatively inexpensive and they're really easy to install and they take very minimal power. Next, Frick. All right, next one comes from Jill or Jim Kilborn in Happy Valley, Oregon. Hey, Jim. He says, I can't, res I can't recall seeing you use a combination square in any of your videos. What are the positive and negative characteristics of this tool that keep it off your bench? Well, they're, uh, they're right here. And actually I do, but... Uh, I, I used my combination square a lot more when I was traveling and teaching because it was just one tool did several things. 
What I like about it is the fact that uh, you can take the rule out and use the rule. Uh, it is obviously a square. It gives you a 45. It's got a bubble level in there. What I don't like about it is anytime you have movement, you, you suffer an accuracy. Now, you can go in and you can adjust it, believe it or not, but you can tune it up. But these are never going to be as square as a solid steel square. So I have two. I have the 6-inch uh, one, and I have the 12-inch version right here. They don't come out of my tool cabinet as often as you see me grabbing a steel square, but they, uh, they do get used. And as I said, they, that used to be my mainstay when I was traveling, just because it was the economy of carrying fewer tools. Next, Rick. Uh, Andrew Actually, has a you know what? It's five after. Let me just, uh, I just want to explain. We don't have a guest on with us tonight, but uh, I'll just tell you real briefly. Can you just answer this one really, really quick? Yes. How, how thick is the saw plate on your... Uh... 20 thousandths of an inch. Point zero, zero, <coughs> no, pardon me. Point zero, two, zero. And it has 2,000 set per side, which would be point zero, zero, two. In relative terms, a piece of writing paper, a piece of writing paper is four thousandths of an inch. So my saw plate is five of these, and the set is half the thickness of this on either side. Why is that important? Well, the narrower the set, the less those little teeth stick out from the blade, the less scraping they do when they cut, the smoother the wall or the surface or either side of your kerf. And if you put two smooth, flat surfaces together, smoother and flatter, the better the joint. So let me explain. Have we made an announcement that we, what had to happen? Yeah. So we, uh, we feel really lucky. We got in our, our first Purple Heart workshop uh, in early September, which is first since COVID. It means we hadn't had a class since the fall of 2019. Hard to believe it went that long. And it was an all Canadian class because the border was still closed. We had seven combat wounded vets. Fantastic bunch, fantastic bunch. Seven civilians who made, who cre helped create the atmosphere that was what we were always looking for. Uh, Jesse Rufians came over from Nova Scotia. So Jesse was in our class back in 2017. He was one of the first two Canadians to come to our class. Jesse was uh, RCR and uh, Canadian infantry. And uh, Jesse had since moved from Alberta to Nova Scotia with his family and set up a little woodworking business. So I had Jesse come over and he worked as the assistant for the week and just, you couldn't have sit there and written a better prescription to make the class perfect. So, plan was, let's do one in October. Let's get one in, squeeze in whatever we can. The province of New Brunswick had taken us, had removed all COVID restrictions on, Mar on July 31st, midnight on the 30th. No more masks, no more distancing, no more anything. Well, that lasted for a while. We had to manage to get our class. We get everything ready for October 11th class. We had the civilians filled. Luther's, on, Luther's coming up to, to help teach. We had, uh, we again, we, again, we went with mostly all Canadians because of uh, travel restrictions and vaccine requirements and whatever. Anyway, things fell apart in New Brunswick. The mask mandate came in a week ago. Friday night, they declared a state of emergency again, medical emergency or whatever they called it. So we're back to uh, all of those restrictions. So there goes our October 11th class. When are we going to be able to hold one again? Your guess is as good as mine. The minute we do, we need probably six weeks in advance, six weeks notice in order to allow us to run a class so that everybody can get their plane tickets and whatever. But uh, if, I don't know if we've officially announced it yet or not, but I'm telling you right now that unfortunately... Our October 11th class is, uh, has had to be postponed because of this. It doesn't make me happy, but we will make the best of it. So why do we do these live workshops? Well, we do these to allow those of you at home to participate. And when I say participate, I mean you can be responsible for helping to bring one of these combat wounded vets to the class where they get to spend six days learning a myriad of hand tool skills they get to take home, thanks to you as well, $4,000 worth of premium hand tools. Um, thanks to Jack and Chris, they, get, they have a band, those who, all the builders, they get to take a bench home. They literally can set up a small workshop where they could build furniture at home. 
So how do you do it? You just go on our website, robcosman.com, on the left-hand side, Purple Heart Project. In the drop-down menu, it shows you how you can participate. It costs us a lot of money, but who cares? It's, it's worth it. Don't even think about that. Um, we cover, as I'm saying this for the benefit of the vets, we cover your airfare, your hotel, your meals, fantastic food. We uh, have you here for six days from early in the morning to late at night, Monday through the end of Saturday. And uh, as I mentioned, we send you home with all of your sharpening, planes, saws, chisels, measuring tools. Comes up to about $4,000 worth of tools. Actually, we added some to it. And we've got some mortar chisels that we're going to be sending out to the guys in the last class because they didn't come in until after they were gone. So if you want to participate, go there. You can make any kind of a donation that you want. We guarantee you, you give my word, that all of that money goes to that program. We don't take a salary from this. And in exchange, to show you our appreciation, we give away gifts at the end of the night. So register for the draw. Tonight we're going to give away three of those cute little sweaters. Remember, this is grandparents, grandchildren day. I guess that's what we're calling it. So if you don't have any grandchildren and you'd like to have a dead cat sweater, it's getting uh, towards the end of the early fall. This is going to come in handy. Warmest garment you'll ever wear. Or you also have your choice of one of the uh, Purple Heart golf shirts. Just a second. Jake, um, will, Jake will show them. They've, they've seen. Yeah. They know what he's talking about. And if you don't get one and you want one, go to Pat's Secret Garden. Moose helps us out. Go to patsecretgarden.com. Frank, 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 Frank will put the link up and you get your own. And these sweaters are just uh, charming, cutest little things. See Mickey run around with that on. We'll try to get them on the, the website. The, the oh, they're not up there yet? <clears throat> no. Oh, all right. So you may have to wait a little bit. Three lucky people won't have to wait. They'll, they'll be, uh, be on the website probably next week. Okay. And any, any combat... So I usually ask that. I apologize for forgetting. We're short-staffed tonight because of this COVID crap. Um, if you're a combat wounded vet that has been to our class, any one of our 14 classes we've had, we've now had 95 combat wounded vets come as our guests. S say something, and we would love to give you a shout-out and acknowledge your presence and your service. Rick, anybody to say hello to? Uh, I wasn't uh, keeping track, to be honest. I'm too, Come busy, on, monitor Frick. I'm too busy monitoring the chat what? and the pro you got, production you're over there. and the questions. Eating dinner. No, that's gone. Playing behind your little green orb. <laughs> yes. Well, Derek, Derek in our latest class just said hello. Who? Derek Knowles. He was in our. Hi, Derek. Brother. Derek yeah. wasn't a combat window vet, but he was. I asked him if he got his, his gift. Yeah, Derek? Moose needs to know if you got your gift. Derek came as a professional cabinet maker into the class, which I told him was great to have because he ups the, uh, he ups the standard in the class. He did a great job. He did some fantastic dovetails. In fact, I was showing them. We did a video just the other day at YouTube, and I used his dovetail in there. A couple people are suggesting that we perhaps hold it. Oh, I'm sorry. That's Matthew. You're talking about Derek. Yeah. Derek's from New Brunswick. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Derek... Well, hopefully Matt's on there too. And Derek was a great guy. A little older than Matt. Frick, don't make fun of my memory. I, it wasn't me. I, I was saying that uh, there's a couple of people who suggested that you do perhaps an online class, like a private uh, kind of Zoom style, and then more you interactive. You know what? We were, we, were, we were thinking about that, and then, you know, we never knew, well, when is this thing going to end? And everybody thought, you know, two weeks to flatten the curve. The longest two weeks of my life. So we will, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, somebody asked me today about classes for 2020, 2022, and I'm saying, well, how do we, what do we do? We don't even know what's going to happen. But yes, I would, uh, I would seriously consider entertaining something like that. Uh, I'm seeing Bobbert here. I'm seeing Kevin, Bobbert. Kevin Burris is here. Kev, how are you, brother? Eric. Eric? Uh, from our latest class. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I don't think anyone does. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kind of going with the most recent. But uh, And don't forget to give a shout out to Angie. Hi, Angie. If you don't know Angie, Angie is uh, Ken, 
Anthony is, uh, Ken's in charge of all the production in our shop. And this is his cousin, Angie. Angie and her sister, Lynn, do all the packaging of all of our t-shirts. So when you get a Purple Heart t-shirt and it's all nicely done up in a bag, cellophane bag with a little picture on there of Angie and an A, that's her seal, you know it's good. Hi, Angie. All right, you ready for a question? Yeah. I'm still working on Eric. I got to bring that back to my memory. Elmerson. Who? Oh, Eric over in Newfoundland. Oh, Eric. Oh, now I'm embarrassed. So Eric, I got to tell you a little bit about Eric. Eric joined the Army at age 50. And most people would think, wow, 50 years old? No, he broke records on... Uh, infantry training and the whole bit. He turned 59 on the front lines of Afghanistan and his commander brought out a uh, birthday cake to him. He actually served with his son, I saw the picture. And uh, just super, super guy, very good craftsman, diligent, worked at it, and still is. Hope you got your, hope your bench is coming soon. But Eric is over, he's not actually from Newfoundland, he lives in Newfoundland, but I think he's actually from British Columbia. Thanks for saying hello and I apologize for being slow on the draw. Go ahead, Frick, next. Okay, next question. Uh, comes from Barry Rogan. He's in the chat with us. Hi, Barry. Rob, a while back you used a block plane blade as a marking knife in a tight location. Can you use an IBC chisel with the handle yes, off to yeah, do the absolutely. same task? Absolutely. I often do that. Which do you feel is better? Um, well, probably the IBC chisel because it's a little thicker. So what he's referring to is I keep this, I keep this blade right here, and I don't, I've never put a back bevel on it. So if I want to go in and make a mark in a specific spot, I can come in and lay it against the side and run it up like that, and it'll give me a, pr a precise mark. Um, if I had a back bevel on there, it would offset your mark a little bit. Now... Rather than do that, if you took an IBC chisel and stripped it down, you could do the same thing. You don't have a back bevel. You could come in there and you actually have a little more material to hold on to. This, this is thinner and there's not quite as much. So that you could actually come in there and hold on to it a little bit better. So that would actually probably be a better... Well, no, because you, you've ground that to be closer to 20 or less degrees. Well, I, I did, but I actually, I just said that. The only downside to this is there's a bevel on there, whereas this has got a square edge, and I just noticed that when I did that, it was a lot easier to grab a hold of this because of that square edge. Your finger has a tendency to ride over that because of the bevel, so. It would work in a pinch, but I think that square edge on the plane blade might actually have a, a slight advantage over this. Let me, uh, I'm just going to take a bit of a, uh, a break in questions, and I want to address in, in the order of the importance. So if number one, or, um, the two most important items in your shop are going to be your bench and your sharpening tools. Your bench, yes, you can't, you, you, have, you can't do any work without it. But your sharpening gear, and I'm going to have to drive this, uh, drill this home to you. This is the stuff that is going to determine how good of an edge you have on any kind of a steel edge tool you have. So if you've got lousy stones because you didn't want to spend the money, then you're going to deal with stuff that is subpar. I always encourage people, spend your money wisely. Don't scrimp on your stones. The better these are, you learn to use them. It's not difficult. I teach this in the first half day of our class. Once you master this, now, I go up to 16,000 grit, and it'll put an edge on these tools that will give you a flawless surface. And I was talking with, um, who was I talking with today? We were talking about, oh, a friend of mine owns a restaurant in the city called Suwana. Suwana. And he brought his dad here to show him around today. And uh, his name is James, plays hockey with us, young guy, lovely restaurant. We've been in there. Called me up one day and said, Rob, I'd like to provide dinner for your, you and your vets for t uh, some night this week. So we came, we provide dinner for 20 people. You know, just fantastic. But that's, you know what? People that do that, they understand why. Anyway, 
he came up, his dad was asking me about sharpening a knife and saying that in a kitchen, the sharper the knife, the safer it is. Well, of course, sharper the pleasant plane, the sharper the chisel. The sharper it is, the less effort you have to apply to push it through the wood. Well, the less effort you apply, the more control you have. And it's all about control. If you're grunting, pu trying to push this thing through the wood, applying that much force, one slip, and you have no idea where the chisel's going. So keep your chisel sharp, get good stones. And I'm gonna give you the recommendation. I'm gonna give you two. The first is the least expensive. And this is a good, very good system. And then I'm gonna tell you what is the best system. That's all right, Moose. I don't think there's any more noise out there. A very good system is to use a diamond plate. And we've got a new one coming in that we had made for ourselves. We, we want a little tighter control on the quality. And that should be here within a week or so. Yeah. It'll be the same. It's just where it's made that's going to make it uh, a little more consistent. 1,000 grit on one side, 300 grit on the other. And you would simply use that to start your sharpening. You keep the 16,000 grit flat by using the 300 grit. So if all you're doing is just plain blades, you need that stone and that stone. This one you start, this one you finish, you use the 300 grit side to keep this one flat. If you want to up your game, then you go to the all Shapton system. The all Shapton system involves a 1,000 grit Shapton, a 16,000 grit Shapton, and Shapton makes their own lapping plate. It's a very expensive piece of kit, but it's extremely flat. The difference is phenomenal but you're gonna pay for it, so you have to decide. If you're doing chisels, I highly recommend you put another stone in the middle. When you're doing the back of a chisel, unlike a plain blade, you've got a large surface you're working on, and you've gotta go from coarse, the 1,000, before you get to the fine, you've gotta work the in-between, and that's where you want an either a 4,000 and an 8,000, or a 6,000, but there's gotta be some kind of a stepping stone in between the two, okay? You're welcome to ask me questions on that or go back to your regular questions, Frick. Uh, Jimmy Sinawaski in the chat says, uh, I notice all of Rob's chisels have a mirror finish on the back. How much time does he take to do that? Uh, I get Fun Jake question. to do that, so it doesn't take me any time at all. But I've done none of them in my life that uh, I don't need to do anymore. How much, Jake? Let's take a three-quarter. Start to finish. On a three quarter? Yeah. 40 minutes? 40 minutes, I'm gonna say 40 minutes to an hour. That's using the all Shapton system. You have to understand this. What you're getting, for, what you're getting and what you're paying for is you're either using that to flatten your stone. I hate explaining this because it makes me feel like I'm giving a bunch of double talk, but there's no other way to explain it. This has a level of flatness, and this has a level of flatness. If you know anything about machining and precision, the higher you go, the more expensive it is. It costs a lot of money to get those extra zeros. So this will get you so far, this will get you as far as your eye can tell. Room for improvement. This piece of kit, which combines a lapping plate and a 1,000 grit stone, costs a hundred and $140. This lapping plate by itself is three, you hungry? Three, 60. 360, three, three, yeah. $380. So what this replaces is the lapping plate, which only purpose is to flatten these stones, a thousand grit stone and a heavy holder. So if you wanna do the math real quick, 140 versus 380, the heavy holder is 105, the 1,000 grit Shapton is 60-ish, 60. 60 so put all that together and that's the difference. I still think it's worth it because the, the way it works on the back of a chisel is phenomenal. Now people always ask me, well how much of a difference in improvement? I'd say well 5-6% maybe. So you have to decide if it's worth it to you. Next, Rick. Um, Am I forgetting anything, by the way? I keep thinking there's something I was supposed to talk about. We talked about the saw. Well, Jake... Uh, we talked about I, the masking tape. I don't know if it's Jake Tarola, but he says uh, you should give away the winding sticks. 
that he sent you. We might be saving those for the next class. But I'll tell you what we are giving away tonight. So for every $1,000 increment in donations, how much are we going? If we hit 3000 tonight, I'm going to give this away. This is a prototype. If it means anything to you, I'll sign the back, mm. and you'll be the first one to have the uh, three-quarter dovetail saw. It doesn't have Len Robichaud's name on the back of it, unfortunately, but the, uh, the real ones will, the next ones. And then we're going to give away at every... Uh, I've got a bunch of chisels, some mortise chisels that we're going to give away. These are used, but they're still good mortise chisels. Are we give them that away? Mm -mm. No? What else? We have 65 people that would buy that saw if it was available right now. 65? I'm not going to be terribly... We got well, I mean, out of... How many? Out of uh, the 500 viewers we have, it, that's pretty we good. Are we down to 500? I don't know if an email went out for this one, did it? Yeah, it did. It did. Oh, I never got it. Slow night. But I'm glad to have those 500. Happy you're here. They heard Luther wasn't here and Super Dave wasn't here, so. Oh, the draw. <laughs> yeah. It's not Super Dave. It's Super Goat. Oh. He has a new name. At least the Frick Cam's here, though. Yes, the Frick Cam <laughs> is here. Could explain the low attendance. Any idea what we have, where we are with donations? Uh... No. I'll give you a minute to figure that out. Give me another question to wrestle with, would you please? Uh, okay. Uh, John Kasarowski. Hi, John. John's down in Florida, right? Uh, I think so. What inexpensive wood would you recommend for practicing as a new hand tool user? Oh, well, if you lived around here, northern white pine is beautiful wood to work. It's, uh, it saws nicely. It planes nicely. It chisels nicely. It just does everything nicely. It's just a beautiful, warm wood. Um, don't be mis don't uh, mix that up with southern yellow pine that'll beat you up probably basswood what you want is uh, an even grained wood relatively straight grained soft and mild and the reason I say that is because soft and mild does two things number one requires demands that your, tizzle, that your tools be extremely sharp Soft woods will crush under the weight of a less than perfectly sharp chisel. But the other thing it does is it allows you to operate the tool with minimal effort. That means you can focus on your technique without having to apply that extra effort to push it through the, the wood. So basswood, as a general rule, is probably your best bet for finding a wood to practice any kind of a hand tool procedure on. Next, Frick. Yep. Oh, and Jake, uh, that camera's about to die. We got a flashing uh, battery. Oh, that one is. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, I'm just saying we won't be able to use it in a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, okay. This one comes from Paul Krukowski. Do you see? Hi, an, Paul. Do you see an issue dovetailing edge grain versus end grain to put a box together? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Approximately eleven by twelve by eight. Yeah. No, no, you can't dovetail the you can't dovetail the long grain. There's no advantage to it. Number one, because uh, those little pieces will easily break. In fact, you'll probably destroy them just putting it together. But so you can glue two edge grain pieces together, and it becomes stronger than the wood itself. So there's no joint that's going to make it any stronger. Um, that's the reason. That's the reason why. But you just you just. I suppose if there's any such thing as a rule, you don't, you don't dovetail long grain or the edge of a board to the edge of a board. It just does not, uh, too easy to split. And then you don't gain anything for all the extra work. Next, Rick. Uh, next one comes from Benji, also in the chat. He says, any hand tool, is there any hand tool to cut sliding dovetail tongue and groove? Um, yeah, there is. There was a, there was a plane made that, uh, that was designed to cut the um, female portion of a dovetail. So in other words, if you would cut a dado, and then you went in and you undercut either side. Uh, there was a, Stanley made that, and they, I never used it. In fact, I've never even seen one live. And I think you could also use it to cut the male portion. 
but I've never I've never used it. I've done that very I've only done that a few times. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and revisit that because um, I will tell you this that you never want to use a sliding dovetail that doesn't have a taper. The reason is it's a very very uh, close fitting joint and the go no go is extremely tight. So if you try if you put together a sliding dovetail that actually fits properly. You gotta remember, you're, you're, you're getting slope against slope. You've got the sloped male portion fitting into the sloped female portion. Well, if there's any slop at all, it's loose, it wiggles, right? So it needs to be snug. The problem is you try to glue that together, but the time you, you're halfway through, the glue has swelled the wood and you can't get that thing through without beating it to death. Now, what I've done before, before I realized this, is I put it together about three quarter of the way and then went in and applied glue on the inside and on the back side and put the last little bit together. But you're far better off, requires some math, probably the reason why I've avoided it, is to have it tapered so that it doesn't get tight until the very last second when it just comes up where it needs to be and that's where everything fits. But that's a long, shallow taper. Just enough to make it so you put the glue on it, it slides together, slides together, and when it gets into position, all of a sudden, boom, it's tight, snug, nothing moves. I, I, I'm going to do that. I just I got to come around to doing it. Um, we recently did that little blurb with gluing end grain. And to be quite honest, I am convinced that a, da a solid wood dado with a solid wood shelf going into it is all that you need to hold a, a, a shelf in place. I don't think I would do the... I don't think... I don't think I would do the bottom of a cabinet. Say we built a chest of drawers, we dovetail the top corners, and then the sides went all the way down. They usually go, they usually go lower than the bottom shelf. So I don't think I would leave the bottom shelf only dovetail, only um, dadoed and glued into the side. The reason is that the, uh, the long grain on the bottom of the dado does not resist shock very well. So you put that whole thing together, let the glue dry and knock it apart. You'll see that the long grain from the bottom of the dado will be stuck to the end grain of the shelf and it has literally pulled itself apart. So that just that's uh, asking too much of wood in its weakest situation. I think there has to be some kind of a mechanical fastener when you're talking about tensile strength where you're trying to pull this piece out of the dado. It's fantastic for resisting the force acting in a shear direction but as the bottom of a, uh, of a bookcase or the bottom of a chest of drawers you'd want more than just the glue st strength preventing it from pulling out like that. Next Frick. Next one comes from uh, Thomas Smith in Nashville, Tennessee. Hi, Tom. He says, "I have a low angle jack plane, and the Been blade. Been Nashville, love it. And the pl jack plane, and the blade always seems to cut a little more on one side or the other when planing slash shooting. Like the blade is never centered. Please help." Okay, I'm gonna I uh, gonna ask him to read that again, please. I have a low angle jack plane, and the blade always seems to cut a little more on one side or the other when planing and shooting. Like the blade is never centered. Please help. Okay. So, is it, what was his name from Nashville? Thomas. Thomas. So, uh, first of all, you're using a plane that I don't like. And I don't like it because, A, it doesn't have as much, it doesn't have enough surface area on the side to keep it nice and stable in that direction. If you were to compare it, it's a lot less. Number two, it doesn't have enough mass. I like it to be nice and heavy. And um, that's the only things that I don't like about it. Other than that, but the first thing you want to do is you want to check your blade. And when I say check your blade, meaning you've got to take your blade out and carefully take a straight edge or something that is flat and up against the light, put the straight edge on it like so and verify there's no hollow in the middle. If there's a hollow in the middle, then you've got a sharpening issue. A, your stones may or may not be flat. Got to verify that. B, 
you must apply uniform pressure along the cutting edge so you're not pressing down too hard on the end or in the middle. Now, as long as that's correct, now it's just a matter of adjusting that. And don't feel bad because, uh, would you say it's the most common problem when people first start planing? They just can't get that blade parallel to the sole. And I just, I, oh, I want to pull my hair out. I'll go over, <clears throat> and the guy has these <clears throat> massive plane tracks in his board that you could almost slide in. And I flip the plane over, and I see the blade sticking way up on one side. And I hand it to him. I said, do you see anything wrong here? No. Really? Look again. It's shiny. Nope. I said, how about right here? What do you see right here? I see the blade. And what do you see over here? I don't see anything. Okay, remember, we have to see the same amount of blade side to side. Oh, yeah. I said, now you watch. And I'll start pushing the lateral adjustment lever. Do you see it move? Yeah, yeah, okay. What we have to do is we have to adjust that until that blade projects the same amount from one side to the other. And that takes a little bit, but if you'll, I'll give you a few tips. A light colored background, set your plane like so. Now I'm looking right down the blade. So what I'm gonna do now is tip it just a little bit. And instantly I see this area right here. It just looks like a thin black line. Keep in mind he doesn't have a bedrock star. And nor does he have a, an adjust star. Spin your adjust star until your blade is way out. And I can easily see it. And I'm looking at it, wipe one direction, by the way. And I say, okay, that blade certainly appears to be parallel to the sole. I don't see more on one side than the other. So then I'm going to retract the blade, pull it all the way in until it disappears. Then I'll start planing. You might want to do this before you put it in the shooting board. You're going to start planing. And in the process of planing, you're going to watch to see where the first bit of shaving appears. And as long as the, play, the shaving seems to be coming out of the middle, you're okay. If it's off to one side, and when I say off to one... Oh, wait a minute now, what's going on here? Sorry, let me get this set up again. Okay. So let's throw this off to one side. So I'm planing, and all I'm getting is a shaving on one corner. Nothing over here on the left, just on the right. And look at these big tracks. If it was on the other side, I'm getting a heavy shaving on one side, nothing on the right, big heavy track. Well, that's when I know there's something wrong. So I gotta go back, and I gotta start playing with that adjuster knob until, in fact, if it's that bad, I'm gonna turn it over and eyeball it first. And you're just going to plane. The, yeah, I gotta get repair all the damage that I did with these big grooves. Now I'm going to retract the blade, pull it in so I'm not taking such a heavy shaving. Still seems to be heavy on the left, so I'm going to push the lateral adjustment lever that way, which will put the right side down and pull the left side up. Now when I make a pass like that, I want to feel, and I can still feel a pretty heavy ridge there. So I'm thinking that's probably still just a little bit too low on the left side. I'll go in and correct it. Now I don't feel anything, so now I'm going to start over here and take a pass. Feel for that. Take one more pass. And if that pass eliminates it, then I'm, I'm okay. If it doesn't eliminate it, then I was still too heavy on the left side. And you got to play around with that until you finally get it right. But check to make sure the edge is straight first. And then you, if, that, if your edge is straight, then okay. Now it's just a matter of me learning to be able to tell when that blade is sitting the way it should. Something else I want to remind you too is when you're using a shooting board, there's some technique involved. 
And if you don't do it right, it's going to cause you some grief. We did a video on making shooting board. If shows you how to do it. And if you don't, we sell them as well. Got a guy that all he does all week long is make shooting boards. When you're using your shooting board, you want to keep that blade, that plane, standing plumb. People, I can't believe how many people have a tendency, instead of pushing the board into the plane so it engages, they lean the plane over like this. How do I know that? I'll loan them my shooting board, and I get it back. This corner's all been cut off, and it's actually got a slope on I it. I think that corner's been cut off. That corner has been cut off. Okay, so you, now in order for that corner to be cut off, look at how much they had to be leaning that in order to do it. This has to stay plumb. So your pressure is applied right here, straight down, pull the pull, hold the plane in like this, but all the pressure straight down. Do not tip that, okay? What you have to do with this hand is you have to keep feeding the board into the plane, but you can't feed harder than you can resist. So if you've got 80 pounds of force selling, putting the plane that way, you can only use 40 pushing the board into the plane. Cut your little chamfer first. Flip it around so that you can then plane until that little chamfer disappears so you don't break off a big piece in the end. Okay? Everybody can stand to use a good shooting board lesson because once mastered, Probably the most, in fact, I don't think there's a doubt, the most efficient shop-made implement you will have. Second only to learning how to sharpen and use the hand plane. Next, Frick. Uh, just a good. couple follow-up questions on the plane. Okay. Uh, Mark Miles in the chat wants to know, is there a reason that the chip breaker is matched to the plane blade? In other words, can you use a Lee Nielsen blade with a Wood River chip breaker? Oh, yeah, absolutely. If it's a 2 and 3 eighths chip, chip breaker... You want it on a two and three eighths inch blade, but there's no reason why they'd be perfectly matched. That's that's not something that's of uh, sh severe importance. You got another one? Yeah, uh, Dwight Lee wants to know, or he says, I want to replace my Stanley original blade with an IBC, but can't get the set with the chip breaker. Can I get it? Can I get by with just the blade without the chip breaker? No, uh, we're, we've been hammering them, trying to get them made again. The reason why you can't put a big, thick IBC blade in an old Stanley plane is because the yoke, uh, pardon me, the, uh, yeah, the yoke. So if you take this apart, where it's a, uh, there's an old one right here. Where? Okay. So here we have, oh, you want to see something nice? Uh, we, you haven't seen this video yet. Yeah, don't show them. Oh, Jake. I was going to show you something, but now you got to wait till next week when we release the video. So if you take the, uh, has this one ever been apart? So. No, it's sitting up on, it's, it's not put back together properly. Where's my... Oh, suit? Frick was playing with it. Why do you, who lets him... The first time you gave me a plane, the thing was in backwards, so that's how I do it now. <laughs> yeah. You should just stay at Costco. No, I don't, look at this thing. What's going on? It's upside, this is upside down. Well, I, I can't. Flip roll. Oh my goodness, I, they've got that jammed in there to the point where it... Uh, well, because it's a wedge, right? Yeah. There. Okay, so that's backwards, not much blade left. That should be turned around like that, and, uh, and I don't know what the... Uh, inside out, too. I don't know what the blade is doing, or the chip breaker's doing. Yeah, they're turning it into a bevel up. So let's get this done right. They've just about out. So there's your, where your chip breaker would sit. Ooh. Speaking of which, look how much wider the chip breaker is than the blade, so obviously not a match set. Um, so here's the problem. This is your yoke. Your yoke connects to your adjuster knob, and that's what allows you to take a thicker shaving or a thinner shaving. The yoke is designed to go through the blade so it engages this little slot in the chip breaker. So if you put a big, thick IBC blade on there, what happens is your yoke doesn't come far enough through. So at the extreme, not even the extreme, much beyond the midpoint, 
the yoke, the yoke will no longer make contact with the chip breaker, so you don't have any adjustment. So what we did, this was a, a, something that I had developed back in 2008, and we got a patent pending on it. My idea was to put two little tabs of metal, stick them to the underside of the chip breaker. It's a shame to be telling you this because they're not even available. Stick these to the underside of the chip breaker. So now when you put that big thick blade on, they reach down in to the slot and they, they manage to reach the end of the yoke so that you have all of your travel. So that's the reason why. And in case you're wondering, a typical blade on an old Stanley plane is anywhere from 75 to 85 thousandths of an inch thick. The IBC blade is 140 thou thick, so it's almost double. So that's the, uh, that's the problem you're going to encounter in trying to put an, uh, a thicker blade without that modified chip breaker. Okay, next. Um, how do you, Robert Bullhost wants to know, how do you, or when do you consider your plane needs to be sharpened? Like, how can you tell? How can I tell if my plane is sharp? Needs to be sharpened. Like oh, needs to be sharpened. Oh, that's a good question. Well, what you'll notice is you're, uh, the first thing you're going to notice is that you have to start advancing the blade a little bit more in order for it to engage because as you, as your blade dulls, your blade shortens, right? And then what happens is you start to get little serrations. So when your blade is nice and sharp, your shaving comes out in one full piece. As the blade starts to get nicks on the end of it, you start to get these serrations in the shaving. And that's the point where it still works, but it's not going to give you that perfect finish. Um, if you've got your sharpening down to the 32 seconds, like I show in the video, then the minute this happens, boom, back over there, sharpen, and go back to work. But you could continue to move a lot of wood with the blade in that shape. It's just not giving you that finish quality that we like so much. Next, Frick. Uh, Malcolm Nicholson. Hi, Malcolm. Uh, wants to know, or he says, I've just finished refurbishing a Stanley number four, but never thought about the throat depth. What should I be setting it to for standard planing function, and why don't you make it, and why don't you make it wide as you can? Well, um, so what? Uh, what's his name? Malcolm. Malcolm Nicholson. Malcolm. Here's a Stanley number four. Actually, this is a three. I didn't pick up a four at all. I don't have a four right here. But uh, let's say it's this one. This is a four and a half. So he's talking about the opening where the shaving comes out. Now, if you can see on mine, it's quite tight. And actually, I'll, if I put something white, I'm just trying not to cut myself on these blades. Can you see? Yeah. Okay, so this is this is fair. This is uh, three quarter tight. If I was really worried about tear out, I would have it even tighter than that. So what we're talking about is this area of the sole of the plane. Oh come on, does it work? Yeah. If you can see the point of that W, I didn't mean to draw a W, a V. The point of the sole of the plane where that tip is and the cutting edge create a little gap and what happens is as your blade is going over that surface of the wood there is pressure being plied by the sole of the plane where I drew that little arrow onto the wood fiber the blade is trying to dig into the wood fiber and if the grain is running in the opposite direction that the blade is going, then it wants to dig down in and lift up those fibers. By having the throat closed tight like that, that prevents that from occurring. It won't allow the fibers to lip, lift up ahead of the blade because the throat, of the, the throat of the plane is sitting right on top of it. That's why you want it down tight. Now, the reason why you can't always keep it down tight is because you would be limited. You can't take a shaving much thicker than that. If you try, it'll jam. Now, do you want your throat open a tremendous amount? Well, how much is enough? Um, you're typically not going to take a shaving 
Let's see. It's going to get jammed up. That's probably as heavy a shaving as most people would take. I would guess and say that that probably measures. What do you think, Jake? I grabbed them, but I would say. Seven? Yeah, I was going to guess. I was going to say eight. Well, let's just see. Uh, six thou. So we, if it was beat the clay, if it was uh, prices right, we both lost. So most people aren't going to take a shaving much bigger than that. So as long as your throat is that open, why have it three or four or five times that? There's no advantage. There's no advantage. There's no disadvantage. So it really doesn't matter. The only time your throat matters is when it's when you're talking about closing it up. And when you want control over tear out, you want to have it as tight as you can get it and still allow the shaving to come out. So if I was taking a one thou shaving, I'd want to set my throat at about one thou, maybe one tenth over one thou, but tight, tight, tight. That's where you get the maximum control. Which the nice thing about a bedrock is that you can open and close that throat by accessing it back here instead of having to tear your plane apart like you have to with this in order to get at those two screws that move the frog. On the bedrock, you simply take your screwdriver, you come into the back side, and the nice thing about having an adjuster, here I am selling something again. Trust me, if you haven't already got one of these, it makes it so much easier. Get in here, access that little frog retaining screw with about a quarter turn, access that one with a quarter turn, and then you can come in here and grab hold of that center one, and when you move it, it, the entire apparatus moves forward or back. That's opening it up. When you get it where you want it, you go back in, snug that one up, snug that one up, and you're back in business. Okay, next, Rick. All right. Any uh, idea how many prizes we're giving away? Uh, not yet. I think we're around 1,500 by now. So I'm keeping my saw. What did you say the... Three, they had to hit 3,000 in order to give away that saw. Okay. I'll get a more accurate number in a few minutes okay. here. Okay. Question? Uh, yeah. This comes from Single Handed in the chat. He says, what blades do you recommend for a router plane? Looking at buying a Lee Nielsen or similar, but not sure what blades to get. Pointed small blades for larger router plane, i.e. Yeah. Um, well, I can't remember what comes standard with the uh, the large router plane. I think it's the uh, it's the uh, square blade and then the point one pointed one. And if I rem when I was doing it, they didn't make anything different. They only made the ones that, the small quarter inch ones that fit the small router plane. But you buy the adapter to put them in the large router plane. So. Um, unless you're doing marquetry or, in, or inlay, where you're having to go in, I shouldn't say marquetry, I should have said inlay, where you're going in and trying to clean out a small area, you're probably never, I, uh, Jake, how many times have I ever used any cutter in the router plane other than the square edge blade? A couple times? Well, you've never, I've never, I've never seen you use the pointed one. Yeah. So, it really, I wouldn't bother going out unless... I would wait until you had a job where you actually needed them and then you then get it. But I don't think you, like I said, unless you're doing inlay work, you'll probably never need it. Next, Rick. All right, I'm going to butcher this name, but uh, Sigurborn Ragnarsson. Sibby. Sibby? You know him? Yeah, the pilot from... Uh, oh, over and over and... Oh, yes, yeah. he and his dad were going to come over and but, come to but class. But let's not, let's not take the moment away from Frank. Go ahead and pronounce that, Frank. <laughs> Sibby Ragnarsson, uh, in the order of planes required, Sibby. where would you rank the scrub plane? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. In the order of planes required, I guess oh, in the okay. order of most important. All right, where let, would let's you do that. I meant, I meant, to, I was, I was kind of motioning to Frick to, to uh, let me give me a chance. So what I want to do is I want to lay out the planes in their order of their value to you. So what I'm talking about now is someone who. Uh, Call them a hybrid woodworker using some power tools, some hand tools, but you're favoring hand tools. So my first plane, and I'm going to give you a couple of options here, would either be the number five and a half or the number six. So why? Well, it works fantastically, fantastically in a shooting board because it has the length and the mass. These are essentially the same plane. The only difference is right here. See that? That's all you got. A couple of inches in the length of the sole. 
all of these components are identical. So whether you get a five and a half or a six, I'm probably a 51-49 split. We actually give a six to the vets because it almost, it can kind of replace a, uh, a jointer. Not really, but close. So that is going to be your first purchase. 85, 90% of the time I'm using a hand plane, I'm probably using this. Next plane I would purchase or want to have would be a low angle block, not a standard angle. The low angle, the distance between the le top of the lever cap and where your hand is going to hold is much lower. This nestles in your palm. It's much more comfortable to use than to be sitting up here like that. Low angle block. And if you want to modify the angle of attack, what you would get with a standard angle block, buy a different blade, grind a different angle, and you get the same thing. But without the discomfort of having your arm up like this. Next plane I would get would be a three-quarter three -quarter shoulder plane. Very unique tool in that the blade goes all the way to both sides, allowing you to work into a vertical corner. Think of a shoulder on a tenon that has to be trimmed so that end grain shoulder comes up tight against the opposite piece. You can't do that with a plane where the blade doesn't go all the way. You have, to be get, you have to be able to get into a vertical surface to do that shoulder plane. Why a three quarter? Well, you're mostly gonna be working with three quarter inch material. So if you're cutting a, more, a tenon on the end of a three quarter inch board, you're gonna have a quarter inch shoulder, a quarter inch tenon and a quarter inch shoulder. So that's covered. If you're working with inch and a half material, you're gonna have a half inch shoulder, a half inch tenon, a half inch shoulder, you're covered. Next would be uh, jointer. So you want, uh, someday soon I'm going to have to resurface my bench top. You start dealing with solid wood bench top, big advantage to the uh, Cosman MDF bench. And in order to do that, I want the long plane to reference the high spots and to help me get it nice and flat. So the shoulder plane, pardon me, the uh, joiner plane. Nice thing about this, all of the parts, all the parts, all the parts, interchangeable. Everything is the same. Difference only in the length of the sole. Now, from there, where do we go? And I, I probably, you know, sway back and forth on this. I would, just based on what I've been doing lately, I would probably put either of these next. Now... He asked about the, shoulder, the scrub plane. Well, if you're doing strictly hand tools, then that has to be put right back up in here somewhere because this is the tool that you're going to use in dimensioning your lumber. So depending on what you're doing, you may want to have that sitting right in front of your scrub plane. Uh, pardon me, your, uh, your block plane. Uh, what else am I going to stick in here? I mean, I, I really like this. Uh, skew block plane. Now the masking tape, I'm more and more convinced the masking tape is almost as good a way of doing it. And I'm not saying that just because these are getting harder and harder to get, but I'm saying it because you don't have to go in and cut the piece, particularly when it comes to doing drawers. If you, if you cut a rabbit on your tailboard, you have to factor that in when you do your, when you put your drawer together so you don't end up having that drawer smaller than you want it to be. So, but I, I like it. It's a great joinery plane. Great joinery plane. The fence makes it. This is the smartest thing Lee Nelson did with this tool was add that fence to it. So that would sit right around there. I'm not going to really distinguish preference here because it's all going to kind of fall into the same one. Now, if I started going out a little bit further, I would throw in my smoother, my four and a half. I don't use that. In fact, Jake probably can't remember the last time I used that. Mm. I, I, I've become so... Uh, comfortable with my le my five and a half that uh, it just leaves everything else in the dust. A ten and a quarter. Yeah, the ten and a quarter, but uh, my, but you know, it's it's a little bit of a specialized tool. As I'm looking at this, your skew block plane is strictly a specialized tool. Yeah, it is, but I mean the skew block plane has more functions, I think than the 10 and a quarter. The 10 and a quarter is kind of a big version of a uh, shoulder plane in that the blade goes all the way to both sides. You've got tilting handles. You've got knickers on either side if you want to score before the blade. 
you have an adjustable throat. It's a really great plane. A little bit on the expensive side if you're working on a budget, but I would definitely want it in, in my list. And the squirrel tail. Yeah, squirrel tail. And it's that, relatively inexpensive. That's under $100, and it's a nice... I love the fact that that little squirrel's tail goes up on, into your palm, and it's just because it's a, it's a great little plane for going in and cutting chamfers <laughs> on something. I would... You know, I would throw that somewhere in here. Now, what other planes do I have? The butt mortise rarely comes out of here. Um, the scraper planes, I don't use them very often, but I would want one or the other. This little uh, rabbiting block plane, Jake stole my blade. No, I didn't. Back. It's the one beside it, and you, you put it stole back? the blade. Oh, that one? I never, I never use this. This is the small uh, 102. And we took the blade out of it for some reason, so it obviously doesn't get used. There's not even a blade in it. The big number eight. I probably use the big number eight more than the number seven just because it's big. Do you ever use a compass plane? Uh, I have two compass planes. They never worked very well. The sole was enough. There was enough flex in the sole that what, what they're talking about is a compass plane. You can actually you can make it do this to do a concave surface or you can flex the sole up like this to do a convex surface. It was, um, uh, I'd almost say it was an idea plane. Great concept, but didn't work that well. I mean, you could get it to work, but eh. Uh, actually, come, a few more planes over here. There's one I forgot to mention. Small chisel plane. That actually probably gets more use. I would put that somewhere right in here. That actually gets more use than the four and a half by a long shot. I never use the edge, rarely ever use the edge plane. These are, um, these are little side rabbit planes where you can go in and you can dress. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example right now, but I, I rarely use them. Nice to have that once in a weird time that you need it, but rarely use them. All right, we've got to wrap this up. Okay, I'm going to cut this back a little bit and say your, your, money, your first money is spent here. Now, get yourself an adjuster. If you've ever tried turning that lousy adjuster knob and it's just a pain to do, this will make it so much easier for you. I, I wish I'd have thought of the idea sooner because I did everything I could. I cut grooves in them. Nothing ever worked. That, does, that works great well. It gives you great leverage. So get one of these, get this, get this, and you could probably do most everything you need to do. At some point, you might want to expand and pick up a few of those, but hopefully that gives you some idea without confusing you too much. Yeah, it is 9 o'clock. So what have we got, Frick? Uh, just under... One, one final question? No, any, any, okay, right. Yeah. Any vets to say hello to? Um, Did Dave ever show up? No. Did uh -oh. I say Joe Bright? Joe Bright's Joe here. Joe Bright. Hey, Joe, brother. Uh, a special shout-out to Joe. He's got a little medical issue or two. You're going to be fine. Get off the weed. I mean, the cigarettes. Got to get that out of your system, <laughs> Joe. Call me every time you need to puff. You call me, and I'll talk you out of it. And hope your dad's feeling better, too. I'll give you a shout tomorrow. We'll, we'll catch up. Anybody else? Uh, probably. I, I honestly... Oh, heck. I'm doing well, four Sean jobs here. Well, supposed to be on tonight. The Sean Shim, the great Sean Shim. Sean McDermott. I was talking to Sean earlier today. And uh, are we out? We're out, right, Jake? Mm -hmm. All sold out. So if you didn't get a Sean Shim, hopefully there'll be more coming soon. But wow, what a right. what a great device for cutting dovetails. Really works fantastically Frick. well. I can't switch the camera. I need you to. Why? What's the matter? I'm at a battery. Well, the other camera's already dead. No, it's not. Let me. Just a second. What are you about to How die? How little you know. A little power struggle behind the camera going on here. Well, my scenes that are set up. The draw is not meant for the other camera, that's all. So I have to program it here. Just give me a second. So what can we talk about while you're doing that? Well, what are we giving away? Was Ray Door on tonight? You know who was on last time and we didn't notice? Was no. um, um, Louisiana. Oh, uh, Pete. Pete Ambrose. Pete, if you're on, howdy, brother. Sorry we missed you last time. All right, Jake, we're fine. I will switch over. Okay, we're ready to do the draw. What are we giving away first? Frick, um, where are switch? we? I, I don't know how many we're giving away. Frick, uh, did we switch? 
Yeah, we switched. We are switch under 2,000. Okay, so my, I'm keeping my saw. So let's start with giving away three of those little kids, the little grandkids we knitted can't, sweaters from, from Peru. We can't, we can't auction the saw, can we? No. No. Why, somebody's desperate to buy it? Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think you would get quite a bit. Well, auction it. All right, send your offers in the chat. We'll take a look at them in a second. Starting bid, $100. All right, so what are we, we're giving away a sweater first? Yeah. All right. We'll give away three little sweaters. Remember, so if you, get, if you don't have a grandchild or someone to give it to, and we'll match up your size, girl or boy, if you'd rather have a dead cat or uh, a... Um, Golf sweat, purple heart golf sweater, tell us and we'll give you that. And if you want one of your own, you don't get it, go to patsecretgarden.com. Those little sweaters are darling, just cutest things. All right, first sweater winner is Kenneth Stewart in Kansas. Hey, Ken, hope you have a grandchild. Next. Next winner is, is this a sweater as well? Pardon? It's a sweater as well, yeah. Cyril Lynch in United Kingdom. Hey, Cyril, hope you have a little grandbaby over there in the U.K., or somewhere. Third sweater is going to Austin Craft in Georgia. Hey, Austin. Grandkids, hopefully, or children. Hey, this might have some young audience. What's next? Uh, so what did you say we were at, 25? So we got to get with two no, prizes? No, no. no, we didn't make 2,000. Oh, we didn't? No. So one prize. What are we going to give away, Jake? Two mortise chisels? No, the bench dog. The bench dog? Oh, the bench dog plane? Okay. We've got a five and a half, a bench dog five and a half that we reviewed, and we did a YouTube on it, and it's right here in the brand new in the box somewhere. So we'll send that to uh, somebody. Tell us who. So there's the saw. If somebody wants it bad enough and you want to bid on it, that's the first off the press. I'll sign it for you and send it. You're getting a prototype, but it works like a charm. Beautiful little saw. I gotta make another one. All right. So what's this draw? Chisels? This is no. This is for uh, bench dog five and a half. It's going to Abdullah Ahmadzai in the United Kingdom. Hey Abdullah in the UK. Long trip. Yeah. Congratulations. So yeah. we're back on in two weeks. I don't know what the topic is yet, but we'll find out. Um, uh, I, if you if you were disappointed because of September, uh, probably October 11th class being canceled, the only one more disappointed than you is me. Uh, I was crossing my fingers, and I just knew in my gut that this something was going to happen. Our uh, hospitalizations just keep going through the roof, and whatever. It's foolishness over with. Frick, where's our? Uh, are we selling that little saw? We're at 425 right now. Bert Rodriguez. So at 425 for that little saw. Somebody wants that little saw bad. But you know what? Some, what? What did they tell me today? I was talking to somebody today. They just bought a skew block plane, a used skew block plane on eBay. She paid 500 and some odd dollars for it. And there was another one that was, she was watching, and it was already up around that as well. So this is for a used tool, but can't get them. Anyway. Uh, Patty, hey. Patty Tack is winning so far with 475. Patty Tack? Patty Tack. <laughs> so Patty Tack, Patrick Tackett. More money than brains. More money than brains. Actually, I just saw a post the other day. So Patrick Tackett, one of my one of my favorite vets that we've had, was just the life of the party. He was gay. The way the way he and uh, he and his roomie used to get cozy. Just kidding. Anyway, just a super guy. And sometime he's coming up. He's going to be one of our one of our uh, assistants if we ever get them across the border. So Patty Tack, brother, good to see you. Where are we, Frick? Four ninety. Okay, so should we put a time limit on this? Yeah, give them another thirty seconds. You got thirty seconds to up your bid. And and whoever's in in thirty seconds time, whoever's the high bid, that's where we're sending the saw. If you know anybody that you think should be participating or, or, or coming as a scholarship vet to our class, heaven forbid when we get to do them again. Will you show the saw real quick? But please? at least get them on our radar. Have them apply. There's the, 
There's Wait, the little nope. saw. This is the uh, this is called the three quarter dovetail saw, and it's going to be the Len Robichaud saw. Len Robichaud was a combat wounded World War II vet, fought all the way through from D Day right right through to the end of the war. It was w in, wounded numerous times, several times seriously, and uh, but he lived to be I I think he lived to be in his uh, late eighties. His son, John Robichaud, is a good friend of mine. And uh, I wish only, I only wish I'd had a chance now to go back and sit down and talk to him and know. I, I would love to take you out and show you some of the last, the last two paintings of Joe Power out on our thing, but we can't go out there. We will next time. Kevin's been doing a fantastic job. So there's the saw. Where are we? Time to, time to call it. Uh, Patty Tack wins. 605 is the winning bid. He, he ran into a little stash of cash. Patty Tack, brother, I couldn't be happier to send it to you. Oh, sorry, I'm over there. Wrong <laughs> camera. <laughs> yeah, the other camera's not working for some reason. Patty Tack, it'll come. Uh, I'll, have Jake, I'll have Jake test it. Or curse it, whatever way you look at it. Anyway, are we? Are, am I ready to say goodnight? Uh, just give me one quick second. You happen to notice any vet names in there that I didn't speak? Say, uh, call out. I'll go back through tonight and I'll read all the comments and find out who, and send an email or text out to any of the vets that didn't uh, get picked up, and we'll be better staffed next time. What's up, Frick? All right, we're good. Say we're your good? good nights. Thank you, folks. We appreciate it. I love talking about hand tools. Um, I'm not sure what our next topic will be, but we'll make it interesting. Luther will be here. With, actually, Luther should actually be here, won't he? Yes. Luther will be here live with us next time. Have a good two weeks. Take care. See you soon. And our combat wound vets, I salute you, folks. Thank you for your service. Appreciate it greatly. See you. <laughs>